Welcome to Leadership Reimagined, where game-changing conversations are reshaping the world of work. I'm Janice Elig, the CEO and founder of Ella Group, Executive Search Advisors, where we are reimagining search through our longstanding commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am delighted to welcome Priscilla Sims Brown, President, CEO, and Director of Amalgamated Bank, to discuss today's topic, Leading America's Socially Responsible Bank. With over 30 years of financial services experience, prior to joining Amalgamated Bank in 2021, Priscilla was the Group Executive for Marketing and Corporate Affairs at Commonwealth Bank of Australia, where she focused on rebuilding trust and pride in the bank with direct responsibility for end-to-end marketing, branding, stakeholder insights, government and public affairs, and environmental and social policy. Other C-suite positions Priscilla held include AXA Financial, Sunlight Financial, and Lincoln Financial Group, and she served as the Chief Executive Officer of Emerge.me, a digital health insurance broker. Priscilla was also on the board of TIAA. I am delighted that Priscilla was able to take time from her very busy schedule. Priscilla, thank you. I'm delighted you're with us. Thank you, Janice. It's great to be here. So you are celebrating your first anniversary as CEO of Amalgamated Bank. Tell us why this opportunity was so compelling for you. Well, you know, Janice, for my whole career, and it's been a long one, I have had some element of social responsibility as part of my remit. That may have come in the form of some of the work we did in marketing, which was focused on communities, or some of the work we uh, have done with the foundation or the giving part. Any sort of corporate citizenry work seemed to fall under part of my job. And it was always the most fun part of my job, quite frankly. This engagement in the community, it, this making a difference as a company, uh, recognizing the power companies have to make a difference. That was all a really big part of what I loved, but a small part of my day, you know, 25% of my desk or or 30% at most. And so when I was sitting in Australia and got the call to consider this and really think about serving the community in all that I do, um, I just couldn't resist. It was really exciting. And they are delighted to have you. So let's talk about a little bit of the history of Amalgamated Bank. It was 1923, right? Sidney Hillman and the leaders of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America wanted a financial system that was easily accessible to hardworking individuals and their families, not just for big business and wealthy people. And so from that simple idea, Amalgamated Bank was born as the bank of the people. And it stuck to its mission. And you say, we don't just have a mission, we're on a mission to be America's socially responsible bank. So how has that grown and adapted to today? From those beginnings as the bank for immigrants and people who were unbanked at the time, we have grown into not only serving immigrants and workers and really being focused on workers' rights, but also other segments of the population, whether it be those focused on racial justice, whether it be those focused on women's rights and reproductive rights, whether it be people focused on climate, big part of what we do. In fact, a third of what we do is in the climate arena. Um, We serve people who are reaching to make a difference in politics. So there are a number of segments that we now focus on all of which have the same underlying value, and that is to make sure that those who don't have access to banking services get access to them in order to fund, whether that be individuals in their, in their home lives or whether that be businesses, which are the foundation for our growth. And then we also take a policy position, meaning we are actively advocating for these change makers and the work they're doing. Most of what you hear from us is around climate, but but also we do a lot of work on uh, issues of the day. Today, we're focused on gun safety. 
and we're focused on reproductive rights as examples. So that's really so topical and timely for what is happening today. But you've been doing it, Amalgamate has been doing it for a number of years. So you're increasing and emphasizing further to really be a socially responsible bank for all people. So what are your four pillars of growth? for good, as you call it, your growth for good strategy? Well, the first is really living up to and telling the story around our mission uh, better than we do. We are a well-kept secret for many people. Even though a former executive with Amalgamated Bank going way back to the 50s helped to coin the term ESG, and at that point in time, recognized that it did not make sense for us to be accepting deposits on the one hand from change makers and and people who thought about progress in this country. And then on the other hand, to be loaning it out to organizations that were harming the the environment or uh, doing other things that that this first group uh, wouldn't approve of. We decided to have this aligned approach, even going back that far. That's our first pillar, really focusing on this mission really telling a better story around this mission and making sure it's understood. Um, The second is really, we are the quintessential segmented bank, meaning we're really clear about the types of organizations and people we serve. And and many of our customers are organizations of some type. And and so we're really clear about that. And we want to understand what the needs are of these segments and really serve them well. So Our second pillar is really around those customer insights. The third one is in providing products and services that are unique to the needs of those communities. So, for example, um, if we are serving a political candidate or a political party, uh, we have bankers who are available 24-7. If one of our candidates needs to uh, move money very late at night or early in the morning, Um, If they need to have very clean understanding of the deposits uh, they're receiving, the the donations they're receiving, that kind of thing, the foundations that are our clients, we want to be really helpful to them in advising them and providing them with the information they need to make uh, decisions that are important to their missions. And so we do unique kinds of work that are bespoke to the segments that that we serve. And that's our third pillar, really, around building those products. And then there's a, a, a pillar just around um, efficiency and delivery. So um, we want to be entirely accessible to uh, those who need to access us digitally uh, and in other ways. And so we, we work really hard to make sure that we put in the hands of, of our customers the tools they need to to really be successful. We are very passionate about our customers because they are value-based organizations. Many are not-for-profits. Some are are small businesses. Uh, But generally what they all have in common is that they're change makers that are really, really trying to do good in the world. And we want to make sure that we're equipping them as much as possible financially to do that. Now, you took over as CEO at the height of the pandemic in a time when critical social justice issues and an economic downturn deeply impacted those clients and communities and organizations that you serve. Given that, do you see, and you called yourself one of the best kept secrets in a way, do you see that more and more clients and organizations will want those services that you're going to provide, again, in, in more efficiently and effectively in delivery going forward? We think more and more as customers, whether they be consumers or commercial customers, are uh, using their voice in matters. Um, We find that more and more our customer loyalty and our employee loyalty is quite high. You know, Janice, we're a B Corp, uh, which means that we serve all of our stakeholders equally, even though we're publicly traded. And what we find is that the people who are attracted to us uh, as a stakeholder of any type, whether that be an investor, though, whether that be a um, customer, whether that be an employee, these are largely values-based uh, and focused individuals. Now, we have a number of uh, people who are just interested in us because they're seeing something happening that they haven't seen before, which is that you really can do good and do well. Uh, and that's appealing to some people. But But most people are just 
um, really fascinated by and excited by the opportunity to partner with a bank that actually is aligned with their values and is actually helping to make change happen. And, uh, and, and so that's, that's been uh, something that's gone well for us over the last uh, first half of, of the year um, that I started, and it seems to be continuing into, into the second. So you don't just see this as a moment in time, but more of a momentum. There's then a pressure on you to deliver those products and services and in the most efficient and effective way, correct? That's right. And look, no one in this bank thinks we're perfect. And so we're working very hard uh, every day to be better at what we do. Tools are getting better as well. We're able to measure our carbon output today uh, much better than we could two years ago. And so as we continue to to learn and access new and different tools, uh, as we continue to work in public-private partnerships on important social issues, as our stakeholders continue to challenge us in new ways, uh, we're just constantly getting better. And then I should say that another important role for us, we think, is not just to uh, manage what we do, but to think about scope three, to think about our suppliers, to think about partners and frankly, other banks and influence them in ways that enables us to sort of punch above our weight. And we do a fair amount of that too, meaning we are engaged in various organizations um, across the spectrum whether they be financial services organizations or outside of the industry. You are one of the, maybe the only bank, Amalgamated Bank maybe is the only one to have a female CEO who happens to be black as well and a board chair female. In what ways does that impact or provide different perspectives to the organization, attract employees, attract customers, make decision-making better in terms of your own diversity on the board, in the C-suite, and I believe throughout your entire organization. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. 65% of our employees are also people of color and women. And we look, we think, um, and when I say we in this instance, I'm speaking really to the board, uh, the chair of our board, Lynn Fox, who is, as you mentioned, not only a woman, but a woman who has been fighting long and hard for workers' rights, um, I think her whole career, She's been a fantastic partner to me. And one of the things that we really try to accomplish is we try to make sure that we are absolutely fair in the way we look at diversity within our organization um, and the way we look at development of people broadly. So, for example, we know that there are incredibly talented women and people of color in the market. We know that if we just ask every manager to make sure that we are bringing women and minorities in, and very qualified women and minorities into each role that we are hiring, each, each uh, candidate pool, that from that, we're going to get a number of very talented women and minorities in the organization. That's worked well for us. We, we are really proud of what we've accomplished, but we're also never satisfied that we've done enough. So we are doing quite a lot around development of employees more broadly and we know that given our makeup, that's going to increase the activity and the the, the opportunity for progression for women and minorities. And you're certainly moving that needle forward. Uh, I remember you spoke at the Women's Forum of New York Biennial um, Breakfast of Corporate Champions in 2021 about really more women in underrepresented groups. And everybody has to focus on that because those are your customers, your employees, your communities, and the investor community that you serve. Priscilla, there's been a lot of controversy around CEOs taking a stand on social issues. In a recent CBS interview, you talked about how the financial services industry can truly help identify patterns of suspicious gun sales or activities. And this would aid authorities. It seems like a simple solution. Can this be done to prevent these horrific events? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Will it prevent every event? No. However, it would make a difference for some, and we think any difference is noteworthy and should be done. So the way this works is we now use merchant codes to detect illegal activity that's occurring in other areas, whether it be mortgage fraud or whether it be trafficking. We can detect patterns that do not look right. And we can alert authorities through something we use called a suspicious activity report when we see activity that we want them to be aware of. 
we don't have that ability with guns because there's no merchant code for guns. So there's no way to identify those stores so that we can create the algorithms to detect what we think could be illegal activity. So we've asked for merchant code. We meaning amalgamated. We were denied. We appealed. We were denied again. And we were not given the opportunity to appeal. And so unfortunately, that meant going public a little bit with this. And now we are in the midst of conversations with the International Standards Organization, which has accepted the idea that we should have an appeal. And we should know by August whether or not merchant codes will be granted. This gives us the ability to detect things called straw purchases. Those are important. This is where an illegal gun is purchased by someone who can legally buy guns. They buy it on their credit card, but they're buying it for the purpose of handing it over to someone else who cannot buy those guns in a legal way. And so what we see as a bank is we see a credit card purchase by a legal gun owner, but then we see money coming into the account of the same amount. We alert authorities that's happened. They investigate to determine whether or not a straw purchase has occurred. The straw purchases have just been made formally illegal by new legislation, and so we want to just do our part to make sure that that happens. So I know that's a lot of inside baseball, but the, the thing to remember is that the financial institutions have a responsibility to make sure that our systems are not being used for nefarious purposes. And we have the ability to detect that if we have access to the right information. And we just want to make sure that we have access to that information. So I want to just remind our audience that you are listening to Priscilla Sims Brown, President, CEO, and Director of Amalgamated Bank, on the topic of leading America's socially responsible bank. The topics we cover like today's are all current, and a new topic with a new game changer is released on the third Thursday of every month. This is a great way to stay current on relevant issues happening around us. Now let's return to Priscilla. So Priscilla, you started off with me talking about you've always been mission-driven, purpose-driven, and it comes partially from being a leader for change that runs in your family. So tell us about your remarkable family, which I happen to know something about, your upbringing, and your mother, the first female senator of Ethiopia, whose focus was trying to better the lives of others. Boy, you know, these days, I don't know whether to start with my children or my mother, um, or my parents, actually, my my father as well. I, You know, look, I'm really blessed. I did not grow up in Ethiopia and with my parents, but at a time, uh, the time that they did, uh, during the 70s and, and even slightly before, Ethiopia went through a number of significant changes, not the least of which was a drought in the 80s, which many of us heard about and will remember the song, We Are the World, and all the work that was going on um, with a number of organizations, including World Vision, to address it. My parents were in Ethiopian uh, parliament and escaped uh, after the demise of the Emperor Haile Selassie and ultimately ended up in the U.S., which my brother, my older brother and I were very pleased about. My older brother was here at college, and as was I. And uh, my parents decided that one person would figure out how to plan and um, support the family, which was ever-growing. Uh, in fact, over the 20 years that they were in the U.S., they raised 59 kids in their home at various times. Uh, and the other parent would, would focus on giving back to Ethiopia. So my mother started Project Mercy as my father was working hard to, to support the family. And, uh, and he started a small manufacturing business. Project Mercy has grown into a very large, comprehensive program in Ethiopia with schools, 1,900 kids there, a health sciences college, a hospital, a farming project, including a cattle breeding farm, uh, and a number of other enterprises. So Project Mercy, you you are on the board of that, is that correct? Yes, I'm on the board of it, but I'm actually the the one family member who has to admit to have done the least amount for Project Mercy since my brother Beite runs the organization and my brother Lali was at one point the country director in, in uh, Ethiopia and he and his wife and two children spent uh, many years there. So I, I sit on the board and uh, and try to help out where I can, but but my parents and my brothers have really 
led this organization over the years. So Project Mercy is really looking at promoting economic development. So how long has it been in effect and what has been that impact? Well, it has been in place for over 43 years. Um, It started as a relief organization um, during the drought. And its purpose at the time was to work with large organizations, mostly from America, who were trying to help during the Ethiopian famine, but really didn't know how to. So so this organization was started to advise them and to do some relief. It has grown into a very comprehensive development organization. My parents just basically went to one of the poorest communities in Ethiopia uh, and s- talked to the elders and said, what do you feel this this area needs and what are you willing to invest and work on? And those elders said, well, look, we want to bring people back. We need a school and we need a hospital. Very quickly, my dad looked around and said, okay, that's that's a good idea, but you don't have roads, electricity, or running water. So let's let's get infrastructure built first. Um, and that has grown into not only the school that we directly run with the 1900 kids, but also support of a number of neighboring schools in an area that had not had education since the ninth century. So uh, going back a very long time, there'd been no no schools in this area. Um, Also have grown now to have a hospital, and as I mentioned, a health sciences college, um, a cattle breeding farm in in an area just north of of, uh, the capital of Addis, but much more in this this community in Yataban, where people are heavily invested. Um, The local farmers gave up land, people give up time and and, um, sweat equity to build this school. And what we feel most proud of are the number of children who started out in first grade, went all the way through, went to college, and then came back and are working in one of the enterprises um, in, in this community. And we're proud of the fact that at least by Ethiopian standards, this has gone from being one of the poorest communities uh, in the country. And Ethiopia, at the time we started, was one of the poorest countries in the world. It went from that status to now being a status where uh, many people thrive and survive in this community. How does Project Mercy tie in with the mission of Amalgamated? Well, you know, it's interesting. I do see parallels, and I've talked about them a few times. You know, like Project Mercy and the work that's going on there, uh, we at Amalgamated recognize that there are people who want to be empowered in their own lives. They're not looking for a handout. They're looking for an opportunity to, to grow. Capital is a big barrier to that, uh, whether you're in rural Ethiopia or whether you're in uh, urban uh, United States. And the two times when capital becomes really, really important to, to people in their in their own development is when you're trying to have capital individually to to buy a home, and also when you're looking to grow a business and employ people and you need capital. We know that underrepresented communities don't have access to that. And so much like what happens in Ethiopia, what we're doing at Amalgamated is helping change makers who want to make a difference for themselves and their communities and just need a little bit of a boost. And in our case, that boost and amalgamated is providing the capital for the much needed work. In the case of uh, Ethiopia with Project Mercy, it's developing a really comprehensive solution to very thorny problems that, that really hit every aspect of life. So in both, in both cases, I think, uh, and, and also I think, as I think about all of the organizations that we serve here at Amalgamated, the the opportunity lies in uh, attacking a problem from all of its sides and really being comprehensive and thoughtful in the work and engaging people in making a difference for their own lives and for their own communities. Priscilla, now you sit in the CEO seat of Amalgamated Bank. You're going to make a major impact with Lynn Fox, your chair, the entire board, and employees there. What was that path, though, to get you to where you are today? Because you're one of the few female CEOs and one of the few Black female CEOs leading a publicly traded company. So I think our audience would like to know, 
how did you get to where you are today? And I know you started out, I believe, before financial services as a reporter for various news stations. So give us a little bit of a brief history of that path for you. That was a brief moment, um, but I, I did. In San Francisco, I, was, I worked for KQED, and I had a small show on an independent station called Chemo, uh, a show called Inside Today's Economy, where we focused on the impact small businesses have broadly across our economy, and then moved to Chicago when my family came from Ethiopia and was living in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I was living initially in Chicago and um, and there did some business reporting for WMAQ. But really that led me to a focus on you know, just the wealth gap and wealth management more broadly. And so I started working in financial services with companies like Payne Weber and The Equitable uh, when I was in my 20s. I went to work for Lincoln Financial um, in Fort Wayne, Indiana, initially, and I worked there for 18 years, both in Fort Wayne and then when we moved to Philadelphia. By the time we moved to Philadelphia, Lincoln had grown from being a focused financial services firm where I focused on uh, starting its first mutual fund and running its broker dealer to now it evolved into a, a multi line. Um, very broad insurance and asset management and retirement company, and uh, started serving consumers. So it became really important to think about how to build our consumer brand. And it was there that I decided to to move into to marketing, as well as the work I was doing around investor relations and other stakeholders. I started on the path with marketing uh, in the early 2000s and continued that throughout my career. I would say that the idea of small business never left me. The idea of the importance of uh, running a PL and sometimes a small PL because there were so many businesses around the country that were representing innovation, doing things differently in our communities and really needed support, that that, that, that sort of love of that segment never left me. And in every one of my jobs, that was a segment that I, at various times, focused on in different ways. And so I'm really thrilled that we are are, are doing work in that segment as I uh, look to grow Amalgamated going forward. So you've had many achievements, a notable career. You were on the board of TIAA. You've had many executive positions. And you were recognized as Crane's notable Black leader in 2022. Who would you say helped you along the way? Is there one or was there an aha mo moment or what helped you to get to where you are and be recognized as you have been? It's interesting. I mean, I think on the business side, there have just been a number of people, really every CEO practically that I've had, uh, that I've worked for, who's taken a, a gamble on me or, or bet on me on a new project when I started the mutual fund and the broker dealer um, uh, growth happening under a man named Ian Rowland and then a man named John Basha, both were CEOs at Lincoln. That, that was probably the most notable uh, and biggest one, but there have been several like that. But what has really inspired me, honestly, has been women, uh, both younger and older women who throughout my career have just been there when I needed to make a phone call um, at some ridiculous hour to talk through something that I was uh, struggling with. Uh, that's been where I have really developed my my biggest strength, honestly, in the business and uh, and not only in the business, it, also in my personal life. You know, in in raising two kids, that that's been where I've really uh, felt that I've I've gained strength and and wisdom and guidance and in some cases inspiration has come not so much from what they've said but but how they live uh, their own lives uh, watching that particularly for for the women who came before me in business so any parting words to our audience those aspiring to move up to the c-suite maybe in a ceo role or how to give back or how to uh, really lead a, a more fulfilling life. Any parting words for our audience? I don't know if this advice makes sense for everyone, but I, I, I will say, and I, I often said, I never aspired to be in the C-suite. Um, that wasn't 
that was never on my list of what I want to be when I grow up. I always wanted to have impact and more impact. And every job decision I made um, and every decision I have made thus far outside of the workplace in the not-for-profits and board work and so on, it's all been um, after answering the question, will this next step have impact? And is it the most impact I have available to me uh, right now where I sit? Sometimes you look back and you say, you wish you'd have gone left instead of right. But with the the vision I have today, is this the next spot for me that will have the greatest impact? And I, I really think ser- thinking that way has served me well. Again, I'm not suggesting it's right for everyone, but for me, it has helped in every decision, whether it's a not-for-profit decision, whether it's a decision about where I uh, spend my money and my time, that's always been first and foremost and really helpful to me. Well, you are making an impact. And I want to thank you today for joining us and sharing your story, your incredible journey, uh, your family background, uh, your sense of purpose, uh, being mission-driven, and now leading America's socially responsible bank, truly a bank of the people. Priscilla, you're making a tremendous impact and you're making a lot of impact on many people's lives, including mine. So again, we appreciate your your time today and, and thank you. Thank you, Janice. And thank you to our audience for tuning in to another game-changing conversation on Leadership Reimagined. You can find me on Twitter, LinkedIn, or visit our website at ellagroup.com. Thank you for joining us today.